This is 9-11 Freefall. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of 9-11 Free Fall. I'm the host, Andy Steele. Tonight I'm going to be joined by Dave Hooper and Jeff Solomon. They're going to be talking about the release of the new version of The Anatomy of a Great Deception. It's going to have some new content, new stuff for viewers to watch. And they're going to be talking about the reaction of the public to the release of the film, the initial release, over a year ago. What that reaction has been, uh, some interesting stories uh, related to producing that for the first time. Uh, as well, they're going to be talking about their own awakening process to the 9-11 controlled demolition evidence. I know a lot of people are interested in that. It's sort of like hearing uh, stories from people about where they were when 9-11 actually happened, when they saw the news. Uh, for people in 9-11 Truth, what they like to often hear about is how other people woke up, how they first came across this information, and what their initial reaction was. I know that's very interesting, especially if you're being introduced to this concept uh, for the first time that your government is lying to you about something this important. Uh, it has a major impact on how you see the world and a very uh, curious and interesting process that takes place within yourself. So they'll be talking about that. Quick reminder, the views expressed on this show by guests and myself on topics outside of the 9-11 controlled demolition evidence don't necessarily reflect those of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, which just focuses on the science of the building demolitions in New York on 9-11. Uh, but Dave Hooper's work covers a wide range of 9-11 and maybe even to uh, some other issues. So you guys can uh, buy the film from his website and learn more about uh, his own take on 9-11 and what he thinks happened that day. All right, before I play my interview with Dave Hooper and Jeff Solomon, we're going to do what we do every week. We're going to take 10 seconds of silence to remember the victims of 9-11 and their families and all the people who died in the wars that followed 9-11. We're going to do that beginning now. And that's 10 seconds. I'm joined today by David Hooper and Jeff Solomon. Jeff Solomon lives in New York City with his wife and twin daughters. He's been there since 1995 when he started attending NYU's film program. After graduating from NYU, Jeff worked in the TV industry for several years, and then he joined a marketing company where he produced video and interactive content. In 2010, Jeff founded a technology consulting company where he has been working ever since. And uh, David Hooper, well known, he was on the show a year and a half ago, I think it was. He's a business owner and filmmaker. He's the maker of The Anatomy of a Great Deception, which chronicles his own awakening to the 9-11 controlled demolition evidence and other aspects of 9-11 too. Which has been or which has gotten a lot of attention in the alternative media world. A lot of people I know have seen it. A lot of people are ordering it. People are still really into this movie, and we'll be talking about it uh, some more today. Guys, welcome back to 9/11 Freefall. Oh, thanks for having us, Andy. Thank you very much. So we may have new listeners. Maybe somebody's tuning into No Lies Radio for the first time tonight, picking up this program, has no idea what you guys stand for, what you're about, even maybe anything about this issue. So uh, starting, uh, we're going to start with uh, David first. Uh, can you just briefly review how you woke up to this issue and, and what made you start doing something about it? Yeah, if this is a... Uh... If this is a repeat story for some people, I apologize, so I'll try and make it as interesting as possible. Uh, in February of 2011, I was uh, what I'd consider just a regular guy. Uh, we had four kids in the house. My wife, uh, three kids, my wife was pregnant. I'd been an entrepreneur my whole life. I was getting ready to start a new company. And I picked up on accident. It was a little clip that one of the mainstream news shows. Uh, about the preparations for the upcoming 
10-year anniversary of 9-11. Now, this was in February of 2011, so this was a good six months before. And in the clip, uh, in this, they had, uh, they just showed George Bush sitting in that Sarasota classroom, and for whatever reason, 10 years later, and I was the type of guy that would roll my eyes when someone started talking about conspiracy anything, certainly about 9-11, um, you know, that's who'd I, who I'd been. But for some reason, this question just it resonated, it just hit me right at that moment, which is, what was the Secret Service doing leaving him there? I mean, it's the only thing they really, you know, at, up until that time, I thought it was their only job, which is to protect the president. Interestingly, uh, and not something to be uh, dismissed, they're also in charge of protecting our money supply, and there, there's some interesting connections to that, which I'll let your audience uh figure out on their own through maybe Google or YouTube. But uh, my point is, is, you know, if you're a lifeguard and you see someone drowning, it's the only thing you train for. I mean, you're just sitting there, you're waiting for this sort of thing. And if you do nothing in that moment, what does that imply? It implies that you either wanted them to drown or you knew they weren't really in danger. And when I you know, so I had this question, and that night, you know, I had the question about George Bush in the Sarasota classroom, because he stayed there for, as it turns out, about 35 minutes in total. And as he arrived, we already knew that one plane had hit the tower, and of course, famously, he was told by Andrew Card on live television that a second plane hit, and he stayed in that school for another half hour after that. And uh, I had a flashback memory because I owned a company in Chicago in, in, when 9-11 happened. And it was in a high rise. <clears throat> and a number of employees called me that morning and said that they uh, were too scared to come into work because they, they, you know, they were worried about buildings being knocked down. And I just started thinking, the people that were sitting in that school in that morning, I mean, they – especially the officials that were in the side room, the dozen or so Secret Service agents, fully aware that while the president was sitting out there in front of a classroom full of children and reporters and parents and teachers, that up to a dozen airplanes were reported as hijacked. How could they have been so sure that some terrorist didn't get a little uh, ambitious and decide to fly into the school instead. I mean, his trip was, had been made public four days earlier. And that began, a, you know, that question didn't change my life by itself, didn't suddenly make me think 9-11, the official story was, a, you know, a farce. Uh, but it did begin a, a journey, which I am still on today. I never started that other company that I was about to start. I ended up immersing myself in 9-11. It, it impacted certainly how I view our government, the world, my belief system, my religion. And uh, I was having trouble communicating this to people. And that's ultimately, to make a really long story short, I just put some video clips together to show to my wife and mom and sister because there was no individual uh, presentation or or there was nothing I could show them where they would look at it and the light bulb would go off. It's it's too big. It's too complex. So I basically just summarized what I had seen, what my research had been, showed it to them, and it absolutely hit home. And then one thing led to another. We raised money. We released uh, the DVD, the basic DVD, last year. And uh, we just released the... Global Master Edition, which has 14 languages and 26 deleted scenes and commentary tracks from, actually, uh, Betsy and I, and I talk about her a lot in the movie and, and the kids and the struggles we had um, while I was dealing with this. She actually comes on and does a commentary track, and we talk about uh, what was going on in the household behind the scenes, which we know that uh, a lot of people go through in this world. So um, to make a very long story short, businessman, I have been converted, I guess, if you want to say, to 
someone that realizes our world is very different than how it is presented. And I feel that when that happens, you need to stand up and say something about it. It's, uh, and so um, that's how I'm here. And then uh, you should ask Jeff how we hooked up. He has an interesting story about that. But uh, I will stop talking for a little bit. Well, no, absolutely. And Jeff, you live in New York City, so uh, I, I'm not sure if you were there on 9-11. But tell us how you woke up to this. And, of course, tell us how you hooked up with Dave Hooper. Yeah, so uh, I will jump back to 2001 briefly just to give you a little context. Um, back then I was 24 years old, and I'd been living in New York City since 1995. I was working in the TV production industry, um, and I would describe myself at the time in similar ways that, that, that Dave has described himself. Um, you know, I felt like I was a pretty normal person. Um, maybe the one way that I differed uh, from Dave is that I'm a pretty big geek, I think. Um, I've always been a bit of a nerd and really into computers and a hobbyist when it came to airplanes. I, my dad, when I was young, would, he taught me all the different configurations of commercial planes, and I would be able to pick out a plane in the sky and say, that's a 757 or that's a DC-9. Um, so I was really into that kind of stuff and, and learning how that worked. And I was also into buildings and skyscrapers, and that was one of the things that attracted me to live in New York City. Um, and when I was going to school at NYU, um, my senior year in 1999, I lived in a dorm down by the World Trade Center, and I would go there frequently and just marvel at this building um, and think about you know, all of the significance that it has and, and think back to the bombing in, in 93. Um, I would also say that I was someone um, who was very interested in politics and current events, um, you know, I considered myself pretty well informed, and I really was, especially back yeah, around 9/11, a, a cable news junkie, and I would watch all the channels to try to absorb as many different perspectives as possible. Um, you know, realizing that you kind of have to triangulate to get the truth. Um, and um, you know, I would always also enjoy looking into big historical events and trying to get behind the scenes and understand what was really happening. You know, the way that those things work, just like I like to uh, try to figure out how computers work and, and different things. So back on 9-11, I was working in Manhattan, and I was living in Brooklyn, um, and I woke up that morning, and uh, one of my roommates had told me that a plane had hit the World Trade Center, and I jumped out of bed. That, that type of news event was like, you know, not, caught my attention in a major way and kind of really... I needed to get to a TV, and actually I was probably in one of the few houses with people my age that didn't have a TV at the time, so I um, you know, gathered my stuff, and I ran over to another friend's house, and by the time I got there, um, after walking across Prospect Park in Brooklyn, um, both of the towers had collapsed at that point, and I was there just staring at the TV and watching this replay of this unbelievable series of events, one after the next, from you know, the planes hitting and the speculation that it was an accident to that it was obviously some sort of terrorist event to the buildings actually just collapsing and crumbling, not even collapsing, but just completely being pulverized to the Pentagon and, and Shanksville. And it was just stunning. And, you know, we the first thing we did was we went out, my friends and I, and we went to a hospital to see if we could donate blood, and there were incredibly long lines. And um, the sky in Brooklyn was very cloudy you could see from you know from all the smoke from Manhattan and really from that day for weeks and weeks and weeks it was almost like I felt like I was in a trance um, and many people in the city it was just incredibly dramatic and the scale of what had happened was just unbelievable it wasn't like it you know it didn't feel like this was a terrorist attack that had happened it the scale was just so much bigger and you know, one of the things that I just kept thinking was how unbelievably lucky, or whatever you want to say, how unbelievably well things went for the bad guys. I mean, that these these people um, that conceived that that theoretically did not have, you know, substantial means, were able to pull off this series of events that just had this domino effect to result in this unimaginable destruction. It was overwhelming, 
and you know it was it was a bit of a shock it was a, more than a shock um and then the other thing i would say about that day was i remember very clearly um everybody that i spoke to was stunned that the world trade center had collapsed every new yorker that i spoke to could not believe that both of those buildings and then later you know the third one but really it was focused on on the twin towers that they had actually collapsed and and disintegrated as a result of these attacks um but nobody that i was with had any suspicion or inkling including myself that it could have been caused by anything other than the airplane even though in hindsight there's a tremendous amount of evidence to the contrary and it sort of has flipped where now it seems obvious um you know that that it was that, that it clearly wasn't at the time the the way the event played out the way the media was portraying it the gravity of the situation it just didn't enter anybody's mind that that I was with um that it could have been caused by anything other than than those planes um so you know it was sort of like a, a big reset it was a it was a incredible shock and from that day forward really as many people say you know everything was different 9/11 changed everything and the years went by and i remember being very surprised um you know in a good way that there were no more big attacks like that at the time it seemed inevitable that there were going to be more attacks like that um and it was really surprising that that there weren't um and i was you know opposed to the war in iraq back then i you know i was not a big fan of the bush administration and i was very skeptical about what to me seemed like trumped up reasons for going into iraq but even with that i never really entertained the idea that 9/11 was not what we were told it was um but all of the little interests and aspects of my personality the interest in you know airplanes and buildings and science really kept stoking my curiosity and i would see articles and and people's theories come up on on the internet and and on various news sources talking about all the different aspects of 911 that didn't make sense from the way the buildings collapsed to you know the way that the perpetrators were identified so quickly and the fact that many of them were presumably not who they were were claimed to be and you know all of the different things that the the aerodynamics or the acrobatics of the airplanes and you know et cetera et cetera um and it all kind of was just building and building in the background but i still had no framework for being able to believe that that it was possible that such a foundational event that i lived through could really be fundamentally different than what what we all thought it was um and uh, gradually um you know i would say probably around 2000 10 2011 um some of the AE 911 stuff started to really sink in with me and a lot of the you know just hearing a lot of experts talk about a lot of the issues related to the collapse of the World Trade Center hearing just a lot of the basic questions that were raised you know pointing out the evidence that I think um Dave's film does a great job of of showing with all the different aspects of the quote collapse that are actually evidence of controlled demolition you know just seeing all of that evidence and seeing a very clear um the lack of any kind of acknowledgement or explanation for that became extremely troubling and then eventually i just sort of fell down this rabbit hole where my brain did make a, a switch and i said look you know i don't really know what's going on but clearly there's enough evidence to show me that whatever i thought was happening is is not the case um and i became really absorbed in researching 911 i got my hands on every book i could read every video i could watch every interview i could listen to and then about a year ago i found anatomy of a great deception and i watched that movie and i was just stunned because unlike every other piece of film or or writing about 911 that i'd read which typically talked about the event and the different aspects of it this was a very personal story about what it was like for Dave to go through that. And for me, that is a story that I really needed to hear because I've been going through something very very similarly and was feeling very um isolated as a result. And to I basically watched the whole movie and my jaw just kept dropping further and further because I think, you know, number 1, there's a very clear almost lawyerly case I think that the film lays out very eloquently about some just undeniably curious <laughs> to put a very 
you know, innocent word on it, aspects of that day. Um, and then a, a very honest story um, from somebody who was saying what it felt like to go through that, and I totally related to that. And after seeing it, I wrote Dave an email, and I said, wow, you know, I, I just wanted to thank him for making it, and I said, I want to reach out and just talk to you because, you know, even though I don't know you, in some ways you seem like somebody who I might know better than almost anyone else at this point in my life. And that's how I got to meet Dave, and ever since then we've been in touch, and it's been a great experience. That's a great story, and I think a lot of us go through that same thing. For me, it happened back in 2007, and I didn't really have anybody fighting me in my immediate uh, vicinity over this, thankfully. Uh, I, was, I was allowed to sort of explore this, and uh, it's a family that was actually pretty supportive and waking up to this at the same time as me. Um, so it's been a year over, I guess it has been a year general time frame uh, that the anatomy of a great deception has been out. What has been the response to this movie? For me, the response has been overwhelming. You know, something that actually at the time I thought was a catastrophic accident uh, turned out to really... Uh, have a long-term benefit that I, you know, we just started really noticing and feeling. And that was, uh, so it's the night before the premiere, and which I think was September 5th of last year. And we were, the DVD was set to run, and that was going to give us, you know, we were going to have them essentially the next day or two days later, enough time to get uh, the DVD copy to a number of venues and people that were hosting screenings for the movie on 9-11. And, uh, you know, this is first movie, and I'm still learning what we're doing here, and there's a last-minute uh, problem with the film. And I needed to, I was actually, we were having a cocktail party that night, and Richard Gage was there, and uh, a lot of the other 9-11 bigwigs in this country, and I had to leave went to Detroit. Bottom line is, <clears throat> um, there were many setbacks in the production of it, but that last particular setback, which added no more than 12 hours, but it was the difference between... Um, it basically meant that instead of us sending DVDs out, we sent digital copies of the movie. And what happened is... is Somewhere along the way, a few of those digital copies got up onto YouTube. Now, I thought that was catastrophic at the time because, you know, we're at the time I was probably uh, 70000 in the hole and three years without income, and uh, we needed to sell a few copies of this so that you know, I wouldn't be uh, out on the streets begging for coins. And... As I'm flying to San Francisco for the 9-11 uh, Truth Film Festival last year, I got a phone call from Howard in our office who said that the movie had gotten out on YouTube and it had proliferated and you know was being hosted across a bunch of accounts. My first guttural reaction was we actually put a copyright claim on, our, on one of them. And then I uh, did a little soul searching and... I'd, I might have mentioned it on our call last year, but the, my investigation into 9-11 really led to uh, very much a, a spiritual slash quasi-religious overhaul, awakening, whatever you want to call it. And uh, as a result, I'm also someone that has come to go with the flow a lot more, that the things that happen around us happen for a reason and there are no coincidences. So, what ultimately turned this into what I thought was a catastrophe into something I think sort of wonderful is that the movie got out there and people started hosting it on YouTube sites and, you know, one point looked around and it was being hosted by over 50 different channels and it had cumulatively, unless I was miscounting something, um, We'd gotten a count of 12 million and then 20, later on 20 million views so far. And I could certainly feel it in the messages and the, in the, the emails I get every day. And I'm, I, I get them from all over the world constantly. 
um, very much like the message Jeff just spoke about, where it's uh, often it's you know someone in a household or they're having trouble with a spouse or a family member or their parents, and this movie helped them because they essentially just showed it to them, and it had the same impact on them that the movie had on my family, which was in an instant. It, it conveyed what I was trying to scream about 9-11 that no one was listening to me about. And it, instead of having all these antagonistic relationships about what I was researching, immediately I had allies. And uh, that's the effect that this movie seems to have. And maybe that's because of the personal side of it, because we really talk about you know, the behind the scenes and dealing with the emotions of discovering something so incredible. Um, so on that note, we had it translated into 14 languages. We uh, cleaned up a few more things. We added 26 deleted scenes, commentary tracks, a bunch of extra stuff, including a really interesting segment we can talk about later if we have time, called The Blind Men. But I don't want to get too far off track on this call. So we put that, all of that together in a uh, what we call the Global Master Edition DVD of the movie. And we actually uh, paired it up with the recent um, – collaboration between architects and engineers and firefighters for 9-11 Truth, which we affectionately called the Firefighter DVD. And we've made a, a little box set where if you purchase them together, it, it's a really big discount over getting them individually. And together, they're an awesome, it's sort of like a one-two punch. Anyone that you want to reach in your life, that you want to, for whatever reason, for your sanity or maybe for theirs, you want to get through to them about 9-11 and start to help open their eyes. I, this box set, based on what I've seen anecdotally, well, does it. The architects and engineers, and my advice would be to start off with the anatomy of a great deception, which is more prepares you to deal with the emotional aspects of this. And then when you're ready for a much better look and detail into the science of 9-11, which ultimately is what makes this undeniable to anybody with any sort of a brain that looks into it. And um, by the time you've watched those two 90-minute documentaries back-to-back, uh, your for your belief system is going to start to change unless you're already aware of these things. So we package it together as something that um, we want to encourage people to purchase these, give them to their friends as Christmas gifts. We've, we're making arrangements so that you can go on our website and uh, send one of these anonymously to a friend, and it's. You know, together these are, of course, most of the viewership is going to happen through the Internet and through digital downloads, and we will have those available, um, streaming and rental downloads for, I can't remember what we were going to charge, but three, four, five, six bucks, something like that. But the DVD is, uh, it's, I was in the media sales business before. It looks valuable. It's nothing, sometimes we get movies in these little, slips of paper or you know the little plastic slide in uh, DVD holsters and yes you can distribute them more but there's this perceived quality that we as consumers have whether we realize it or not it's one reason that a seminar that charges $39 per visitor will get more than the exact same seminar that allows people to come in for free perceived value so anyone receiving this box set, this is not something that they're going to throw in the garbage or let just collect dust on some counter somewhere. This thing, uh, I feel good. It, it feels good, and I think it's something that if 
we can get this out to enough people, it will it will help us get to that critical mass, the point when enough of the population understands what's happening that we essentially induce the hundredth monkey effect, if you're familiar with what that is. Very quickly, that's after doing nuclear testing in the 1950s off the Bikini Islands, we uh, put some monkeys, uh, we repopulated the islands with some monkeys to see how they would do. And uh, they were dying off, dying off, because they were eating radioactive fruits and vegetables. And then one day, a monkey was out in the ocean washing a vegetable. It was a coconut, I think. It ate it, survived, and then the next day there were ten monkeys out washing uh, washing their food before they ate it. And, so, and somehow, magically, the next day, and there was no verbal communication between these monkeys, all of them, all of a sudden, it's, be, it's as if the information, it became known by the entire body uh, of the herd or the clan or whatever monkeys travel in. So I think that's a key element for this country is to get to that hundredth monkey, get it to the point where enough of the population gets it that the mechanisms of deception no longer work. And when that happens, I mean, that's really the only chance I see that we are going to be able to salvage not this, not just this country, but I think uh, the whole planet. Because the guys that did 9-11, they didn't set up their massive complex just to pull off one little job. This is an ongoing, very active, uh, I'm going to call them enemy. And if we don't do something quickly... Um, they've got more planned that is going to dwarf what 9-11 was. And so uh, we're, uh, we're in a race against the clock in a lot of ways. And uh, once again, I'm going to stop talking and let you ask a question. Maybe get Jeff involved in here. Or maybe, Jeff, you can talk a little bit about, I know you mentioned that <clears throat> you showed this film to your family, um, and you'd had some trouble connecting with them about this. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what their reactions were so the audience can hear it from someone that actually went through it. Yeah. Um, I would say the reactions that I've gotten have been different based on, obviously, based on who I've shown it to. Um, I, um, my wife has been someone that I've had a difficult um, time with on this issue, and I think that it's mostly because she sees the impact that all of this research and distress has had on me, and, you know, at a certain point, it's almost like, I think, from her perspective, it doesn't even really matter what it is that you're trying to accomplish. This is really harming you, you know, this is really causing you to um, to get to become concerned and, you know, perhaps even counterproductive or unproductive to, to an extent that, that, sh that, that she was concerned. Um, so I think that because she saw that impact with me, uh, you know, happen to me, I think she's um, been resistant to really dive into a lot of the details of this. And I don't blame her. And I don't blame, I really don't blame anybody that's resistant to this because, you know, I, I can only talk about my own experience, and for me, this took, you know, years and years and years of self-motivated research and and time. Um, and if I hadn't gone through that process myself, um, you know, and, and so many aspects of that process involved reading something, thinking it sounded, you know, un unbelievable, but wanting to just verify that it was unbelievable in, instead of assuming it was, tracing the source and then finding out more information that, that led me to believe, well, actually, this piece of information might be, be valuable, you know. Um, so there was, there was so much integrity to the process of going through this that I had to go through myself that I can't blame anybody who hasn't gone through that 
um, you know, for not being able to see things from that perspective. And I think, um, you know, that, I think that's one of the biggest challenges with this issue is that, you know, it's especially when you, when you, or at least for me, when I began to really develop a, a changing worldview as a result, it became very difficult for me to talk to people who couldn't relate to that new worldview. And a lot of those conversations became unintentionally, for the most part, antagonistic, um, you know, and it, it, it's very difficult. And you, you ha- it, it almost feels like you're trying to talk, um, but you can't speak, you know, because there's just this volume of information that you feel like you've absorbed that the other party has not had a chance to weigh in on. And it's like if they haven't had a chance to weigh in on the same information, then you're really not talking about the same thing. And it, then it's it's sort of not possible to have have a discussion. Um, and I think that, that, that your film, Dave, um, does by far the best job of anything that I've seen of, in a very concise way, sort of laying out the, the greatest hits of basic information. And I've shown it to a number of people. Most of them um, have been extremely receptive to it. Um, and I would say, you know, it's definitely the, the minority of people who have not felt like it's really um, contributed to a big <coughs> awakening for them. And I think for me, really, you know, again, with, with my family situation, it's, it's not even so much about the information itself. It's really about, you know, what kind of impact that's had on me. Um, and the fact that this subject area, you know, has, has been traumatic and stressful for me. And particularly until I, I had a chance to connect with, with you, I really didn't have an outlet to discuss this with anybody who I felt like I could relate to. So it was all very internalized, um, you know, and very isolating. And I think that the opportunity to, to have a chance to meet you and share my thoughts and see somebody whose bookshelf looked like my bookshelf, you know, and whose YouTube history looked like mine, um, you know, and it was as a result of watching Anatomy of a Great Deception that I found the 9-11 Free Fall podcast, um, you know, and Andy, you've been somebody that since I discovered the podcast, I've gone back and listened to virtually every episode, so, you know, I feel like I have a similar, well, well I've never met you before, I feel like we're very much on the same page with a lot of stuff, so I've had a lot of things that have happened that have helped me, um, and I'm still trying to find the best way to really explain to somebody who doesn't, who can't relate to this, what is actually happening or what has happened to me as a result of this. I mean, it's obviously, this is not just, um, well, you know, before I went through this experience, I thought that the, that what happened on 9-11 was what was conveyed in the 9-11 Commission report, and now I know it's different. Okay, you yeah, know, wow, that's, that's a big difference. Yeah, why do you play. think some people, why do you think some people care like the three of us uh, it changed our lives and there's others that it's even if you've shown it to them and you know they know it it's like they don't care i guess i don't understand that do do you guys have an explanation for that i i don't know uh i think that part of it is maybe it's personal experience knowing that if you let something get out of hand that uh it can reach a point where you can't come back or it can cause a, a lot of disaster if you don't do something about it maybe it's being in those kind of circumstances and then applying it to the greater picture like 911 this is something that you can't just let get out of hand i mean it's already gotten out of hand it was a controlled demolition 3000 people were murdered you can't let whoever did this get away with doing that so you need to do something even if you're the small guy, even if you're just the little guy. Something interesting that I saw or that I heard Jeff talk about was uh, changes in conversation, uh, relating to people in a completely different way. You know, I study other sciences. I'm not an expert in anything, but I, I just, for my own personal interest sake, like to. I get on these bents about different aspects of science, and the thing that I've been into lately is human evolution. And I've watched these. Uh, Same here. Uh, How funny. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, that's okay. No, but it, it's like you talk. You look at different species and how the migrating to different areas of the planet have affected their development and turned them into different species. And I've even watched some things speculating on what would happen to humans if we like ever colonized the moon and how people would develop because of the difference in the, uh, uh, in gravity, how that would affect the human body, and we might have different kinds of humans and hundreds of and hundreds and thousands of years in the future. Uh, fun stuff, but I think that you could apply some of this thing, some of these concepts to 
the intellect too and to how you perceive the world. And so if you wake up to this and you're immersing yourself in all of this information, it affects how you see the greater world and how you go about your days and interact with other people and how you uh, look at the news and interpret events. Whereas somebody who is not awakened to this, has never had an interest in bigger issues like this, uh, we'll look at all of those things I just listed in a completely different way. So it's like you've evolved in two different directions here and it becomes harder to relate because what happens with species, it becomes harder for those species to relate and breed. And uh, in an intellectual way, I think it, it makes people, it makes it more difficult for people to, to relate in that kind of fashion too. Um, that's what I think and some of the some of the parallels that I've been seeing. Oh, and when you look into it, and if you look into certainly 9-11, it's, plain as day, and if you follow the uh, investigation tentacles, let's call them, um, you'll get a, you'll quickly understand that our world is really different than the way it is presented to us, and uh, that may not seem important to regular Joe, who's been going to work every day at his job at the insurance company, or the technology company or whatever it might be because that's been working every day so far but there will be a day if we don't do something about this there's that sort of freedom does not exist and it's not really a question of if it's a question of when every nation that's ever existed has gone through these cycles of you know we've gone from bondage and we're going to end up back in bondage it's it's the typical you know, there are about seven stages of a nation's rise and fall. We can see it throughout history, uh, no matter which it is. And America is right on schedule. Her freedoms are being eroded. And it's not, it's not an accident. It's not an accident that the Patriot Act was pre-written before 9-11. It's not an accident that we, our intelligence community, knew we wanted to start a war to give us a reason to go into Iraq in the first place. Um, it's the hidden agenda, it's the esoteric agenda at work that is the one that is really eye-opening. Because it's 9-11 was more, was about a lot more than just oil, the erosion of freedoms, uh, a major increase in defense spending, major tax increases that are really that have this country on the edge of um, fascism. So it's hard to, for people to see the bigger picture because you're so focused on the, on the semantics and the tangibles of 9-11. That is no reason to stop this investigation or to, you know, to get caught up on that. The point is, is those buildings were wired to come down one way or another. When you boil it down into more simple terms, you start to realize, you know, there's different ways of trying to communicate this to people. And I was just talking with Jeff about having certain stock replies or metaphors uh, just ready to go that will help people get their arms around such a big concept. I mean, this is such a such a big deal that my only theory of why some people don't care more about it is it's just too overwhelming. It's just, you know, hey, I've got bills and I'm having a hard enough time just getting by. I do not need my, uh, you know, my, my life shaken up like this. But it's going to be one way or another, either by choice or by decision at some point in the future, unless folks like us keep multiplying. You know, someone like Jeff, he's a lot like me and a lot like you, which is we are just now ramping up and gaining speed, and we're normal people. Jeff's the CEO of a company in Manhattan with twin daughters. You know, um, last time I checked, he does not wear tinfoil hats, and he's one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. So um, it's very encouraging when I see people like that coming now to me saying, hey, I want to help. I want to learn more. I want to. That for me is an incredibly encouraging sign because 
before this movie, all I had really met was resistance. But I think we found a way to put it into a package that strikes home. And, uh, you know, my hometown has been, many of them been you know, have changed their worldviews. I, I, I talk to them often. They, they see them a lot. And uh, scary, yeah. And it's caused divisions. It's hard to be friends with people that, you know, are still in the quote unquote the world versus quote unquote reality. But you know that our whole purpose of working together and this movie and the things that we have coming up in the near future is to put tools out there that people that know the truth can use to help wake up their circles around them. If everyone that understands the truth of 9-11 bought five or ten of these things and handed them out to five or ten of their friends, and many of them will then go on to do the same thing, we will, in three degrees of separation, the whole country would know. And that's certainly more that's than what is needed for a critical mass type of tipping point. So um, I'm encouraged. I mean, that I don't know how it's going to manifest itself. That'll be the job for other people to rally and to turn this into some sort of action, whether that be on Capitol Hill or in some other venue. Um, but Jeff and I and a few other people that have come together in this way, I mean, we're we believe our job is to put the information out there so we can at least so we can so at least it, it it's available to somebody because it's as you know Andy um, mainstream media it's no accident but they they really they're never going to touch the biggest stories in the world they just don't now i want to make sure that you guys have a chance to talk about the blind men story so either of you that wants to tell this story go ahead and uh, share it with our audience Jeff, you want to you want to give that one a shot? Yeah, I would be happy to. Um, and maybe I'll just give it a quick little prelude because um, I think it relates by saying that I think at the end of the day, for me, the most important aspect of this is that this is all about the scientific method, and that is the core of what this entire process has been for me. And when you hear people talking about changing worldviews and not being able to trust the media and, you know, all of these big topics. It's very easy to want to tune out. But I think it's important to stress that throughout my entire journey, um, at, at no point in the process was my journey um, informed by anything other than the, the basic scientific method. It's having a theory about the way something works. It's analyzing the evidence, saying, does it match up? yes or no. If it doesn't, you have to investigate more evidence and come up with a new theory. And I think that, you know, that's one of the paradoxes of this time right now is that I think most people would say that, you know, in the 21st century, particularly in America, you know, if we have any, any big, big ideas that drive our society forward, it's our belief in science and our belief in being objective. And I think we've gotten to the point right now where there are certain aspects of information that you can arrive at through the pure scientific method that if you just get up and say these things um, will make you an, an outcast in society in many ways. And I think that if you really think about what that means, that's a very important clue that there's something really wrong. And, you know, again, I, as I've gone through this process, I've thought to myself what the word belief means and really how, you know, everything that that we perceive about the world is based on belief, even if we base our beliefs on what we consider to be science and the scientific method. But most of the things that I believed that made it hard for me to, to, to go down this road and investigate this issue were beliefs that I had thought were based on, you know, science and common sense, you know, the idea that if this information was true, that there would be a lot of people talking about it. Well, there are, you know, it's the belief that there weren't was a belief that was not based on factual information. You know, the fact that if, if the buildings were destroyed in some sort of controlled demolition, there would be evidence. Well, there's plenty of it. It's just that my belief prior to that was that I somehow would have known that it would have come to, it would have found its way to me and to everybody else without me having to, to seek that out. So I think, 
you know, every single piece of information, everything that I believe in now is based on nothing more than looking at evidence, trying to prove theories, moving on where they need to be moved on from or, you know, changing paths. And that's what this is all about. So so the story of the four blind men is basically a story. I don't know exactly where it originated, but it's a tale about uh, a town of people that, that are all blind. Um, and there is some sort of a, a – they detect some sort of a threat outside the town gates. So the town elder sends four people out to go investigate what this is. So these four different blind men walk outside the town gate, and they each walk up to this threat that they perceive, and they all use, they use their hands to figure out what it is. And one person feels something that's very sharp and very hard and thinks that it's some sort of a you know, sword or some sort of a, a strong weapon. Another person finds something with his hands that's very long and kind of slimy and thinks it might be a snake. Another person finds something that feels like a big tree trunk. Um, and, you know, the fourth person maybe feels something hairy. And at the end of the day, when they come back, you know, they each had their, they were each feeling their own parts of something. And when they told the town elder what it was, he was able to piece together based on all the different things that they were saying that they were, look, that they were looking at an elephant, basically. But each person was, you know, investigating a completely different aspect of that animal and not looking at the whole thing holistically. Um, I think, Dave, you've told that story much better than I just did. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. or. No, that's great, but it's basically that the parable captures the concept of pooling the worldviews of others. And uh, one of the things, you know, for me that I, I came to realize that uh, most conspiracies, at least most of the ones I've looked into, they have a lot of merit behind them. They're not fueled by wackos living in their mom's basements. They're, they're fueled by scientists and witnesses and regular people that are risking their lives and pensions and careers and social standing and reputation to come out and say something. So we're putting together a, a weekly podcast show. Uh, we've brought together four people uh, with different backgrounds, but similar in that they've gone through the experience of waking up like we have at one point or another. And we're going to be talking about things certainly like 9-11, getting uh, into deeper aspects of it, maybe incorporating a little more of the spiritual side of the emotional side of all of this, um, and not just the hard science, because there are plenty of people that are handling that very well, like architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. And the idea is to have uh, basically a 40-minute to one hour, sort of like a roundtable discussion. We put in our first, let's call it, pre-test pilot episode, where we've got the four of us discussing more deeply the personal impact on our lives, how this affected our families, how we've dealt with them, the best responses we've come up with, coping skills for the the way that we now perceive the world because the old coping skills don't completely work so well anymore. Things like that. Again, all under the umbrella of tools that can be used to get the truth into the hands of people easily. The uh, movie is The Anatomy of a Great Deception. There's new stuff added. People can get that. Uh, we certainly sell it at ae911truth.org. But I think we're selling the box set solely through our show, through our website. You can click on links at ae911, which will get you to the site. So if you don't do that, you can tell your, if you'd like to tell your viewers to visit, it's the same movie site from before. It's agdmovie.com. Okay, if you want to get the new box set version, you can go to uh, Dave's AG, you said agdmovie.com, right? Yep, All right. for Anatomy of a Great Deception, uh, agdmovie.com, and uh, everything else will make sense once you get there. Well, every great 9-11 movie gets known by a set of initials in the end, so I, I know that, that. That's true. I guess we got our initials. <laughs> it was Richard Gage is the one that, that 
coined it. There you go. All right, folks. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Good luck with your podcast. I'll be listening, and uh, thanks for coming on 9-11 Freefall. All right, Andy. Thank you. Thank you very much. This program's on every Thursday night on No Lies Radio at 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific. You can also download MP3s of this show from the Internet Archive by going to 911freefall.com. This is Andy Steele saying have a great week and good luck. We're in a free country. Why are we afraid to just talk about an event that was the most traumatic event in our history? I originally believed the official story. I aggressively defended it. When I first started cracking open that little window that there could be possibly more to this story, I went through every emotion, just like probably a lot of you here who didn't originally believe it or consider it are going through. And I didn't want to believe it. I came up with every excuse not to believe it. Any building that succumbs to fire, that collapses, starts usually with large gradual deformations and the building will begin to fall over, not straight down through the path of what was the greatest resistance. These buildings exploded. We have witnesses that hear sounds of explosions. We started walking down the stairs, we made it to the eighth floor. Big explosion. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel. Molten steel running down the channel rails. Like you're in a foundry. Yeah. Like lava. Like, like, it was like lava. lava. Volcano. This is all direct evidence of explosive controlled demolition. Interesting thing is fire can't create any one of these, let alone all ten. If the FDNY and other firefighters start speaking out about this, this is going to explode and it's going to open a lot of people's eyes to what really happened. Make this a normal thing to talk about so that this will spread like wildfire. It's starting now. From speaking out and starting this website and meeting Richard and a lot of the other incredible people here tonight, I've also met some military intelligence officers that have taught me a lot. And I asked one of them, how do we win? We can't get through the media. We can't get through most of our friends and family because it's too scary to talk about. How do we do this? And he said, it's easy, Eric. You just shine the light. And he said, just come from a place of love and not fear. Shine the light.